Hello everyone, I'll be with you shortly. Just let me get a few more things in order. Uh, let me know if the audio is coming out loud and clear for you. Mutant Ref, I uh, hope you'll have some people that will join you soon. I see you there by yourself, buddy. I'll be with you guys in just a bit. Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, and this is a little bit of a of a twist here where we're having the live stream for you on uh, Thursday evening, East Coast time, and Friday morning here in Singapore. I got some things to need to take care of Monday, so we're kind of substituting Monday's live stream for today. So again, thank you for being here. Mutant Ref, uh, third world trillionaire. Patrick Bateman, how you doing? Harry Schultz, Wide Winger, first time I've seen you here. Welcome aboard. If it is your first time here, go ahead and type in new and where you're from, and we'll see if we can go ahead and and acknowledge you. Okay, so let me see. Bells is out here. And wouldn't you know? Okay, hang on. Frank Park, how you doing? Ron Shackleson, Lillian Winston, how you doing? Pablo Pina, how you doing? Okay, Frank Park. So a few new names again. We appreciate you you all being here. It's always nice to, to see new names. Uh, a lot of things going on. We're going to be taking a look at some things Jerome Powell said. We'll be going back and taking a look at a few things that the resource maven Gwen Preston said. Um, and I'm going to be seeing if I can get one of our directors at Silver Bullion on a phone call just to, to see how supply and demand and things like that are going so you can you can hear it from his perspective as he's he's very close with what's going on in, in that aspect of the, the company. So we're going to be calling him just a bit. Um, really, we're just going to be taking a look at a few things going on. I, I know there's quite a bit, actually. So again, Dr. Crypto, Pablo Pina again, thank you all for being here. And if it is your first time here, please do subscribe. Hit the bell to be notified of new updates. And as always, give us that thumbs up. That thumbs up really makes a difference for us. And you can always find us on social media. Silverbullion.com.sg is where our website is. We do sell gold and silver, but we, we absolutely do specialize in systemic wealth protection. So again, if you know what's going on and all of these things that are going on around you, do visit our website and the products and services that we offer that can help with this systemic wealth protection that is surely on its way. Facebook, Silver Bullion PL, or Silver Bullion SG, I should say. Twitter, Silver Bullion PL, PL for Private Limited. Audio versions, bit.ly, SBTV iTunes, SBTV Spotify. And Crisis Tracker, again, if you have that Telegram app, do join us by adding crisis tracker where we go ahead and we will post um, economic news, financial news, gold and silver news, things like that. We kind of go through the weeds for you and bring up some things that are pretty significant. So I do hope that you will join that crisis tracker group. So again, I want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, Bill Wood from Tampa. 
Okay, first time I've seen your name here. Welcome aboard, Bill. Thank you for, for taking time to, to be with us. Um, yeah, Pablo Pina, uh, the yields, bond yields, yes. They did spike today, and commodities are in the red, dollar in the green. Actually, I think it's, the dollar has been struggling to stay in the green. Uh, yesterday, I saw it break below 89, or 90, I should say, and uh, I think it's back up above 90. So, yeah, it's a good um. A good point that you that you bring up there uh smith welcome aboard emperor bear namaste nice to have you on board upcoming guest on sbtv we're going to be talking to gerald salente i think most of you know him he is the founder director of the trends research institute and the publisher of the weekly trends journal magazine it's a great publication he's developed a global nomic methodology to identify track forecast and manage trends and is a political atheist that is true he does not take sides and unencumbered by that political dogma rigid ideology or conventional wisdom solente whose motto is think for yourself observes and analyzes correct events or current events forming future trends for what they are and not for how he wants them to be so he's not out there trying to create narratives he's just giving it to you straight and the rest is up to us how we are going to take it so gerald salente he'll be coming up i see a new guy out there kevin hacker how you doing uh, over in australia okay nice to have you on board as well um let's see Casey willis is saying peter schiff and systemic wealth destruction gold mining stocks has been pushing since august 2020 gold mining stocks have been have been doing very very well dr crypto 101 sorry about that gerald salente great guy I, absolutely i mean i've been fortunate to to have a chance to speak with him a few times over the years and um he's the real deal you know he he is the real deal you don't find very many guys like him so gerald is is always a, a treat but i'd even call him a, a treasure Really, really, really great guy. Dr. Crypto, yes, think for yourself. Think for yourself. So having said that, our ebook prize this week, same as last week, we're going to be giving away Chris Marcus's book, The Big Silver Short. And his book goes over how a similar situation is playing out in the silver market at this very moment. And The Big Silver Short provides the perfectly timed hand guide to profit from one of the greatest investing opportunities in history so we're going to be giving away chris marcus's ebook over on kindle so do download that kindle app for your phone or for your tablet from your app store and be the first to answer correctly in this live stream before the timer runs out you're going to have about a minute and 30 u.s winners you're going to be given a link to download that kindle ebook gift winners outside the u.s we're going to have to arrange for some sort of an alternate prize because Kindle does or Amazon does not allow gifting ebooks outside of the U.S. And you're going to have to give us your email. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and mute your comment. And then my colleague Vincent, he's always here. He will go ahead and uh, take your email address after muting your your comment, so that way nobody will be able to see your email except for us. And then that way we can go ahead and get in touch with you. So having said all that. First one to answer Chris Marcus's book, or first one to answer the question, will get that Chris Marcus ebook. And the question is going to come from our interview with Gwen Preston. Gwen said, The blank days of the US dollar are done. The blank days of the US dollar are done. And I want you to think in, in market terms, it can be kind of a, a broad question here, but she did say, The blank days of the US dollar. Dollar are done. So go ahead and just give it a shot. It's free to try. So go ahead and, and if you watch that interview, you, you might be able to get it straight away. Uh, but if not, again, just go ahead and, and just give it your, your best shot. So we've got about a minute more or so. So go ahead. Feel free to guess. So Brian D'Alfonso, last. Bill Wood, best. Okay. Keep it coming. You never know. You may just get it right good hey days okay these are pretty good answers last okay glory okay golden 
All right, it's you guys are got some good guesses out there, and I'm still waiting for it. Fiat, um, okay, best. All right, keep it coming, keep it coming, and we'll we'll let you know who the winner is or was or was not. So it's got about 15 seconds or so more to go, 10 more seconds or so. So we'll we'll see if anybody gets it out there. Okay, so. There you go. Time's up. And that's it. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, yeah, this time maybe it's a, it's a bit rough. Maybe it's a bit tough question. Or you guys didn't watch that interview. The answer was bull. The bull days of the U.S. dollar are done. And here's that clip from, from Gwen, the resource maven. Are we in a weak dollar scenario? I mean, right now we're in a bit of a flat dollar scenario. It's a bit range bound and it's not doing anything too dramatic outside of, you know, COVID crashes themselves. Um, but I think there's lots of systemic reasons to believe that the bull days of the US dollar are done and that we're heading into a bear market. I don't think it's going to be a dramatic bear market, but I think it's a shift from those strong days that we had um, previous. Okay, so the answer was bull. Do you think the bull days of the dollar may be done? I mean, like I said yesterday, I noticed it below 90, and today I think it's struggling to get back above 90 on the on the Dixie, the DXY. So um, anyway, this is one very, very honest guy out there, Patrick Bateman. I didn't watch the show. All right, that's, I like that. Very, very honest man. But what do you guys think? Do, do you think the bull days of the dollar may be done i mean we're seeing so much things going on with stimulus the money printing um asset buying and things like that and it's not just the u.s we're talking global uh in europe same thing is happening so you know there there is going to be some type of repercussion a shift a change whatever you want to call it but could very well be the bull days of the dollar may be done so interesting interesting to see what you all think out there I don't want to play two more clips from that Gwen Resource Maven interview because I guess maybe like Patrick Bateman, some of you didn't have a chance to watch it. So I'll just play a few more clips because it was overall pretty interesting. The primary use of nickel is in the creation of stainless steel. And so that remains the biggest driver of nickel. Um, and so from that more boring yet very important side of the picture, um, what we're seeing is that uh, looking ahead to an economic recovery and, you know, guess what building the building that happens in an economic recovery needs copper and it needs, it needs stainless steel. It needs all of those things. Right. So we're looking ahead to that um, from a vantage point where nickel was probably under underpriced. Okay. So she, again, she's talking about nickel. And so I want to just go ahead and, and pull up a, a chart on nickel, just a, a simple chart right now. It's at a, uh, 19,661 per ton. And if you look, we've seen it going up steadily since March of last year. What makes nickel relatively special is, again, it, it is a key component for stainless steel and construction materials and things like that. And it is probably the key component next to lithium for lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles. And when you take a look at the 25-year the chart for nickel, the price, you see that it's highest. Highest price was almost 50000 back in May of 07. So when you look at nickel and compare it to silver, just the same as silver, it's barely touched halfway, or it is a little bit more than halfway over its all-time high. Nickel is not even halfway there uh, approaching its its all-time high. So uh, nickel, kind of similar to, to, to silver, but one of the key differences is, is sil nickel is going to be in very, very high demand with things like electric vehicles. So that was something that Gwen wanted to point out and, and will point out as, as well. So one more thing that Gwen said. Stainless steel manufacturers and battery manufacturers need the product that nickel sulfide mines create. They can also get it from those laterite mines. It just has to go through an extra and somewhat expensive step to turn it into the right product, but it also can come from there. But ideally, they would love to lock in supply from nickel sulfide mines. And so if you are um, interested in the nickel space, I would encourage you to look for people who are finding or developing nickel sulfide deposits in, in supportive jurisdictions. There's not that many out there, um, but I think those are the ones that are going to shine specifically in the next sort of in the next few years. 
Okay, so that's a great point from Gwen. Uh, you know, this was in reference in that, or partly in reference in that there is only one price for nickel. We look at the nickel price, we just see nickel. But there are two very distinct uses that we often touch on from, well, from time to time anyway. Where class one nickel is what electric vehicle battery makers want. They want that class one nickel. And, and it's much, much more difficult uh, to use class two. It has to go through a bit of a, of a process to, to get it ready. Let's just use the words clean up that nickel, that type of nickel, in order to be used for electric vehicle batteries. And so what they want is this class one nickel, very specific use. And I believe less than half or so of all nickel mined is this class one type of nickel. So there is going to be a very high demand and supply is, it can tighten up very, very quick. And, you know, we discussed that if ever the price of nickel should bifurcate, meaning nickel splits up where class one nickel, because it has a distinct use for electric vehicle batteries, has its own price and class two nickel has its own price because it's used for other things, uh, whether it's in construction, stainless steel, things like that. Uh, there could be a price of different or difference or bifurcation, I should say. And it means that class one nickel could be extremely undervalued today. So having said that, I want to move over to take a look at our website, silverbullion.com.sg. Look at this, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. So you can buy and sell metals, buy and sell, two-way, okay? And here are the nickel parcels. We'll get into that shortly. U.S. dollar, uh, silver, in U.S. dollar terms, it's holding steady, about 27, mid-27 range. And um, despite all that's going on, we do see silver always being able, so far, to bounce back pretty quickly. From whatever, I mean, if it goes below 27 into the 26, 25 range, it does seem to bounce back fairly quick, which is a very, very good bullish sign for silver. Gold had a bit of a rough day, 1772 per ounce. And there we see nickel may have to adjust this after seeing what the that price chart showed. And what you want to do again is you do want to sign up for this star storage account you always want to have this ready ready to go uh, whether it's a personal account joint account trust account or a joint account with a minor business account even on retirement account you want to have these things ready to go and it, it's fairly simple fairly simple to do uh, let's say if you want to do a retirement account you're going to have to select which one you want and you, you're probably going to well you will have to have an administrator to to handle your account to make sure your account is all in order and then you would be able to to go ahead and purchase precious metals from us holding it in your ira account uh fairly simple again just name uh country code mobile number things like this in fact it's not even necessary and this is going to enable you again to buy precious metals for your ira account and most importantly for us go ahead and click in sbtv as being your your source so again if you have an ira or superannuation fund you can also open that retirement account with us and i'm not going to go too much into details about it but do go ahead and either send us an email at sales at silverbullion.com or give us a call at plus six five six one zero zero three zero four zero and what i want to do right now is i want to go ahead and uh give one of our directors Verhel via Soto a call and I want to ask him about what's going on as as far as demand and as well as supply because you know we see these um Wall Street silver tweets and things like that uh silver short squeeze going on so you know we, we hear all kinds of different things so I just want to let you hear what's happening on our end so I'll go ahead and uh, give him a call Okay. Hey, Virgil, how are you doing? Okay, hang on there. Okay, technical difficulties. Things just wouldn't be right without technical difficulties, right? So let me go ahead and try and uh, call him again. I'll try one more time. 
hopefully it'll get through. Hey, Hi, Virgil. good morning. Hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good. Ho hold on, let me just uh, turn down my computer here. Yeah, yeah, good, uh, good morning and good oh. evening to our viewers in, yeah. uh, in America and Europe. Hey, thanks for being here, Verhel. Um, some of you may already know Verhel. You may have uh, been be dealing with him for for some time. Great guy, uh, Verhel. You know, we we've been having a lot of questions about demand. Uh, can you give us some insight or the viewers some insight as to demand over in Asia or specifically Singapore? Right. So, demand for do you want to start with silver or with gold? Uh, silver first. Right. So silver really the the demand has been has been sustained, right? Uh, since that uh, February first weekend, we we just couldn't get any small format uh, bars nor coins out of the West. So that's been ruled out. We cannot get anything out of the U.S., out of Canada, out of Australia, even out of the the U.K. Uh, just couldn't just because of a backlog. Um, that was a crazy week. Uh, that was three and a half weeks back when we, we sold 10 tons of, of a silver during a, a weekend in a span of uh, three days. So if we do get them, the, the premiums for 100 ounce could be almost as expensive as, as one ounce silver coins. So, so we've been fortunate in that we can still buy um, at, at a somewhat better rate out of Turkey. So we have uh, Turkish bars from Istanbul, and uh, Nadir brand. That's been um, that's still pretty decent, um, but of course, if you're talking about really really good priced um, bars, then nothing beats the thousand ounce silver bars. That that has been that's been really selling well. Uh, I know it's not a very common product for for our Western customers to buy, but if you look at the spread, it just makes sense to get those if you have the the budget rather than getting like. Uh, small ones so so of course granted we the, the the demand for small ones are is really has gone way through the roof you know in in the west you know uh asia maybe not, not as much but uh, that's because gold has a more universal appeal here um so um going back to silver we we are just due to receive about uh, 10 tons so typically when we buy uh, large silver bars, we, we'd get them out of Hong Kong and they would be in a container, shipping container of 10 to 20 tons. And we were supposed to receive them last week. So there was a delay of almost one week. And the explanation was uh, that there, there is a port congestion here in Singapore. So it, th there is a sign of, of, of heightened economic activity here in, in Singapore. This is still a very, um, a, a very prominent, very big global shipping hub, trading hub. And that's the case for both silver and uh, and gold. Yeah. Um, gold bars are are flying out of Singapore hundreds of kilos, half a ton each day. That's what I hear from our from the refineries, from from suppliers. So so yeah, it's um that's been the that's been the the case here. Um, premium wise for for gold bars. Uh, premiums are have still been on the uptick, and that's that's been going on for the past couple of months since last year, really since mid to late December. So th there has been a um, uh, 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 really high demand for gold in Asia. So specifically, India and China are 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 gobbling up gold. So Sing Singapore being a hub here, the the the, the bullion banks have just been um, arbitraging. Um, you know, buying the buying what scrap they can, <clears throat> uh, buying whatever gold bars they can, and shipping them to to India or to to China just because they can get a they get it could fetch a higher premium over there. So, um, yeah, gold coins, um, yeah, you just couldn't obtain them. Very difficult to obtain. We have to wait for quite a while. Uh, flights are not there, right? That there's the in infrequency of of uh, of planes <clears throat> flying in due to COVID. So, so yeah, that's that's pretty much the story for gold and silver. Okay, so you would say um, there's still a bit of a supply chain issue, but uh, wait, before that, I just want to touch again on, on the the thousand ounce bars. Um, we've seen them move uh, pretty um, they're pretty hot right now. As far as supply, are you able to to resupply on these thousand ounce bars fairly fairly? 
I guess simply would be the word. You you can say that. So we source mostly from out of Asia. Uh, so the LBMA does certify many plentiful um, refineries that can mint, that can refine good delivery, thousand ounce silver bars out of Korea, out of Hong Kong, uh, and 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 these are these are good name brands. So so supply um, for now is uh, not an issue. There there has been that uh, traffic, you know, out in the seas. So port congestion. Um, we we hope that's been overcome. Uh, so yeah, large bars are still, we, we can still get them. It's really anything less than that, anything weighing less than a thousand ounce that is quite difficult to, to get and a bit of a bit expensive to procure. Okay, so I guess we can expect to see some premiums going up a bit. Um, that could be, yes, that is, that is how I see it. So I'm uh, here in Silver Bullion being part of the the, the, the so-called purchasing team. I'm also heavily involved in, in, in that, in the trading. So we, we, we have been, uh, yeah, uh, reacting really, you know, responding to, to the market conditions. And that may be the pattern that we see in the next uh, couple of weeks, next few weeks. Okay. And as far as uh, customer demand, when it comes to gold, what maybe one or two gold items do you see as, as the most, um, the, the ones that are being bought up the most? So we're gearing towards um, a lot of um, our, our buyers are still re really individuals, and uh, th th these guys are are the pragmatic ones. So they buy whatever offers you the the, the lowest spread, and that would be the hundred gram bars and the and the kilo bars. So that's that's really what's been uh, flying off the shelves, you know, as far as demand uh, out here for storage for vaulting in Singapore and all around Asia. Okay, and as far as gold price and silver price, what's your what's your take on it as far as the uh, the price action for those two metals? Well, silver, like you mentioned, has been has been holding really steady, has been holding well. You know, whenever there's a pullback, the the industrial demand for it is is really strong, is highly strong. Uh, gold, on the other hand, I mean, the, the, we see its paper price uh, has been has been coming down, but that has been countered because of the the, the physical. Demand for it anyway is, is also very good in terms of it being a, a wealth preservation tool, the true money. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would think this is just my personal opinion. Silver would be holding uh, really steadily. And, 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 yeah, I mean, unfortunately for, for the buyers, you know, the premiums have been, have been going up. So, it's, yeah, it's still a good time to buy. Okay, and so would you say uh, what we see going on in the West are more or less the same things going on in the East as far as uh, the demand for silver and gold? It's a, it's a really a global take right now. Um, yeah, you can say that. So, so, so again, our, our buyers really are, are, um, are the practical people, you know. So they, whenever they see the price going down, they just, they just buy whatever is in stock. Um, we, we allow for pre-order as well. Um, Delivery times, lead times are still decent for for these uh, so-called uh, big size gold bars or even hundred gram gold bars. Uh, not, not much of an issue. It's really the coins that can that can take a while, take a long while, and are and are re really, uh, as you can see, the premiums are heightened, uh, have increased. Okay, Verhel Vio Soto, one of the directors at Silver Bullion Private Limited over in Singapore. We appreciate the time you've given us, and we'll let you get back to that. Uh, to that computer of yours, we heard the keys rattling when we first picked up the phone. So I'll let you get back to work. Yeah, yeah, it's a busy day, so we're we're at the, we're on the weekend now, approaching the weekend. So yeah, still have work to do. Okay, all right. Thank you, though. Thanks for help. We'll we'll be in yeah. touch. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, so for help via Soto was kind enough to join us there and give us uh, a take of what's going on in in Singapore. A lot of times we we get the Western take, so I wanted to uh, throw in the Eastern take, so we can pretty much get a a, a roundabout global perspective of, of things that are going on. And another way to get a perspective of things going on is, of course, taking a look at Twitter and seeing what's going on there. Bond tsunami is coming. Uh, we are slowly seeing, well, I shouldn't say slowly, it's been moving pretty, pretty rapidly now, where our bond yields have been going up. So maybe I'll just take a quick look at, at this article here and uh, see what it's it's about um 
Let's see, just the key points. Bond yields, which move opposite price, galloped higher Thursday as the market began to question how long the Fed can stay on hold if the economy booms as much as expected. Yields rose, and this is a big deal right now. Yields rose on a combination of optimism for the economy as well as inflation concerns. And, I mean, this has slowly been getting more and more news. If you've been here for a while, you know that we've we've pretty much uh, been talking about this almost each each time. And the 10-year yield was expected to reach 1.5 by year end, but it hit that level Thursday. In fact, it even went over 1.5. So again, what's happening in the bond market does have a lot of people on edge right now. Michael Leibowitz, is it possible that the Fed is getting uncomfortable with the excessive speculation and risk-taking in equity markets and willing to let the bond market take some of the wind out of its sails. Uh, part of the theory here is if the yields go up in the bond market, then it may pull some money out of the equities market. So again, everyone's searching for that yield, and that's that's what they're looking at there. Uh, David Morgan, trust me, says Janet, everything is under our, our control. Janet Yellen, one half of what I like to call the Wonder Twins. Chris from Mulin, good morning traders. The dollar is down big and gold continues to fall as well. We are seeing money flow out of most asset investments, which to me is a warning, a warning sign that institutions are moving to cash, anticipating a wave of selling. So they all want to have that ammunition to move around into other assets. He is expecting or anticipating another wave of selling. Jay needs to be an octopus. Let's go ahead and see this short clip here. Uh, because Jay Paul, he's really got his hands full trying to do so many things. Audi UK, Not sure if he can do it all. With IBM IX and using the IBM garage methodology, transform their way so, of working. Let's just get to do this the commercial from experience. Audi. And here we go. As rates rise, the Fed is facing a new challenge, avoiding a taper tantrum. Taper tantrum. Steve Leisman joins us now with more. How long ago was that? I don't know. Time flies, Steve, when you're having fun. Hey, Joe, the rising yield on the 10-year this morning, highlighting the ongoing challenge for Fed Chair Jay Powell to keep a lid on rates while the economy and the job market recovers. Powell appeared to succeed over his two days of testimony, but each time he stopped talking, it looks like yields crept higher. 10-year yield picking Wednesday at 143 dropped during his testimony, and this morning is around 146, the highest level in a year. Bond traders I spoke with yesterday offering this list of factors pressuring yields. You got massive fiscal and monetary stimulus, a strong growth rebound expected. Inflation fears, including the Fed aiming for inflation above 2%, which makes some bond traders think the Fed doesn't have its back anymore. And then you have this eventual tapering and rate hikes down the road, and you don't want to be the last one to the door. Michael Kushma, chief investment officer of, at Glo Glo of Global Fixed Income at Morgan Stanley, believes 150 is the high end of the current range for yields. I think Powell can indeed finesse these challenges. He told me, quote, the doubling of yields has caused some indigestion, but not a big sell-off. It's not policy-driven expectations driving rates higher. If that were true, we'd see equities struggling more. Powell made clear he will abide higher yields driven by higher growth, and that's a positive for the outlook for stocks. But the bigger question is if the Fed can avoid a jump in rates driven by markets bringing forward expectations for policy change and a rush to the exit. That would present a tougher backdrop for stocks. Okay, a rush to this the kid exit. Yes, you do not want to be the last one in the room. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Singapore, 60,000 charging points for electric vehicles by 2030. Uh, government here is is trying to accommodate uh, the electric vehicle, the green push. And, um, you know, I think Singapore is an ideal place, especially for electric vehicles. It's relatively flat. It's not a very big country. The weather is usually warm all year long. So it's, it's a perfect ideal place for electric vehicles and the government is taking advantage and creating an initiative for electric vehicles. That's I think that's a good thing. Nothing to see here. Look away. I was going through my Twitter feed this morning and came across this. 
this series will no longer be updated. More information is available in the notes below the graph. This series is the suggested substitute, the M2SL. Basically, the M2 money stock was pretty much distributed weekly or, or we were updated weekly and they're going to choose to do it monthly. And I wonder why. <laughs> why do they want to do it monthly instead of weekly? Um, I Let's just hope, um, you know, we're all still able to gauge what's going on here since we're only going to see this now every month. I would expect that these numbers are going to tick upwards quite a bit from month to month. So that there is pretty interesting from the from the Fed that they're changing it to a monthly instead of a, a weekly. Uh, Jerome Powell, same song and dance. Fear of inflation is causing investors to speculate. The Fed may have to shift policy sooner than expected. And again, we're going to take a look at some things Jay Powell said. D.C. pushing for statehood as the Fed Feds turn the capital into a fortress. So I, I guess this is all still up. The barbed wire is still up. The fence still up. And apparently, from this article from Business Week, uh, D.C. is pushing, pushing for statehood. Uh, that's different. I mean, this has always been considered the, the people's house. And uh, it wants to be its own state, or it's looking towards that. The European market set to follow the pack as global markets trend higher. Uh, European stocks are set to open higher. Let me see. I think this is more because uh, the Fed... European Central Bank, they're accommodating businesses. I mean, and that translates to more money printing. Fed expands record holdings of U.S. debt. We'll take a look at that. And I just want to play this one more clip from you. Last clip. Can the U.S. dollar lose its global reserve status? And gold is on the rise again this week. As Daniel Lacaya, if he puts it down to the central bank's printing massive amounts of money. Daniel's the chief economist at the Chess's Hedge Fund. Absolutely. If we look at what is happening globally, uh, we see that uh, more and more central banks are falling into the trap of very aggressive monetary policies, increasing money supply. And for a large proportion of citizens all over the world, the only way to preserve the um, value and the purchasing power of their savings and salaries is, uh, is to purchase gold. That's why the gold price and also silver have been going up uh, recently and why they continue to be a good investment option for so many people. Additionally, it's interesting, but central banks themselves purchase more gold when they increase money supply because they also need to diversify and increase their own reserves. So there's a double support on the gold price as monetary policy intensifies in its aggressiveness. On one side, citizens trying to escape from the risk of currency debasement and central banks increasing their reserves. Okay, so we, we kind of get the picture there. Buy, buy gold. A few more news articles from Gerald Salente's Trends Journal. And I tell you what, it's a great publication. I've had it for almost a year now. And it's, it's truly enlightening. Gerald's perspectives are, are incredible. Gold off to a slow start. It's off to its worst start in 30 years. Uh, despite our love for the metal, it's having a slow start. However, according to the Trends Journal, it should hit 2100 an ounce and silver will push above $50 per ounce. And he uses the words push above 50 per ounce and the dollar will continue to weaken. And we are seeing that dollar had a little bit of an uptick today, but it, it is it's still range bound and, and sub 90 does look to be in play for, for the dollar, which should push up gold prices, should push up silver prices. But but more than that, you know, it's a stimulus going on. Um, it's the money printing going on. And, you know, these are things that will surely look to push gold and silver higher, which is why we're having quite the demand right now, as Verhel Biosoto pointed out. Also from the Trends Journal, building materials reaching record highs. Low interest rates and low supply of homes are pushing demand for new homes. This is still fairly quiet. Uh, however, due to the wildfires last year and the slowdown in manufacturing, the supply of building materials are slowly creeping 
crawling along. Supply is, it's uh, the demand is is pacing much quicker than supply. And lumber futures have gone up some 40% this month. And mills, lumber mills are behind in filling orders. Compound that with winter weather. And it has added to the slowdown in production and added to the higher lumber prices. One more bit from Gerald's Trends Journal. Global shutdown cost 225 million jobs. This is pretty significant. The lockdowns have cleaned out some 225 million jobs worldwide. Significant number. Yeah, absolutely. This number is four times that of the Great Recession. Workers 24 and younger lost their jobs at twice the rate of older workers. And concerns of a lost generation are growing. 81 million simply dropped or dropped out from the labor market and are no longer filing unemployment. So quite a bit of things going on there. Let me catch up with you guys and see what's been going on in the comments section. Um, let me just take a quick look here. Uh, yeah, silver squeeze baffles me. Can't wait. Can't wait till the day everyone will find out there isn't any or not much silver. And, you know, again, it's something I, I think maybe a lot of people don't really pay, pay attention to. But I think more and more as they visit, visit the websites of bullion dealers, uh, on the internet and, and they see how, you know, a lot of the supply is, is weeks out. Um, I think they're going to start to start to understand what's, what's really going on with the uh, precious metals markets there. Uh, let me just see if I can find another, another comment here and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Mark Hill. Absolutely. This is true. Silver has outperformed gold a lot lately. And and we're seeing that you know you can really see that. In fact, I, I should have shown this. Let me let me get back there. You can really see it in the the gold silver ratio. And um, let me just go back down here and show you it quickly. We're under sixty five. Okay, the gold silver ratio or silver to gold ratio is sixty four point six. We are under sixty five. And I know a lot of you folks had a target number where you were going to flip your silver into gold. But being that, you know, gold hasn't really moved and silver has moved somewhat. The flipping silver to gold right now may not be as, as attractive. Uh, you may still want to hang on to your silver, or even still continue to, to buy silver. So that was, a, that was a great point there. Let me um, move on a bit and get back to, to your comments. Uh, absolutely great point that, that you brought up. Silver to gold ratio, it is getting lower, but when is that time, when's the right time going to be when we flip that silver to, to gold? Okay, so Jerome Powell, he spoke recently, and I want to go over a few things he said and then go into his, I affectionately call her, the Wonder Twin, his colleague, and something that Janet Yellen said. So let me start with something that Jerome Powell said. Um, on inflation, um, let me say that uh, we do expect that um, as the couple of things. One, first, as the very low readings of last March and April drop out of the 12 month calculation as we move forward this year, we expect readings on inflation to move up. That's called base effects. That'll be a temporary effect and, and it, it won't really signal anything. More importantly, though, with all the factors we've been discussing, uh, you could see spending pick up pretty substantially in the second half of the year. And that would be a good thing, of course, but it could also put upward pressure on prices. And I would just say uh, that um, essentially uh, it, it's not, it doesn't seem likely that that would result in very large increases or that they would be persistent. We've all been living in a world for a quarter of a century and more where all of the pressures were disinflationary you know, pushing downward on inflation. We've averaged less than 2% inflation for more than the last 25 years. Inflation dynamics do change over time, but they don't change on a dime. And so we don't really think how, see how a burst of, of, uh, of fiscal support or, or spending uh, that's not, that doesn't last for many years would actually change those inflation dynamics. I, I will also say there's, uh, uh, forecasters need to be humble and have a great deal to be humble about, frankly, but so if, if we turn if, if it does turn out that, that unwanted inflation pressures uh, arise and they're persistent, then we have the tools to deal with that and we will. Uh, 
Um, shall I, shall I continue? So, so on the balance sheet, um, you know, we're going to continue to, we're at a stage where with, with, uh, with 10 million people, um, payroll employment is 10 million below where it was, uh, before the pandemic, you know, we're a long way from maximum employment. We're going to keep the balance sheet's going to continue to provide to provide the support that we think the economy needs. Um, over time, it will we, the, the growth of it will slow, uh, but it, that, that decision is the one that that uh, we, we talked about earlier, where asset purchases will continue until we make significant further progress toward our goals. Okay, geez, it almost sounded like uh, old Jay was scolding us there for a minute. You know, <laughs> nonetheless, summarizing. We expect readings to move up. They are called base effects. They are temporary and won't really signal anything. Okay, Spending will pick up substantially in the second half of the year. This will put upward pressure on prices. Is that called inflation? Anyway, it won't be large or persistent increases. Again, according to Jay, he also said, summarizing, we've been living in a world for a quarter of a century where all the pressures were disinflationary, pushing downward on inflation. We should be grateful, right? Is that what he's saying? And inflation does not turn on a dime. It doesn't just doesn't just come up all of a sudden. If unwanted inflation arises and is persistent, we have the tools to deal with it. Apologies for keep interjecting here, but that tool is the only tool, and that is the printing press. That's really the only tool. And the balance sheet is going to provide the support the economy needs. Asset purchases will continue. We're going to take a look at that. And I want to stay on inflation for just a moment more. And I want us to listen to what this gentleman, Carl Weinberg, had to say about inflation. Well, good morning, Steve, Jeff, and Karen. Thanks for having me on today. That's the question, isn't it, inflation? And uh, I think that Steve is a perfect test tube for the experiment as to uh, w how this is going to play out in both the economy and in people's minds, because perceptions are more important than reality. So if Steve goes to the, the, the petrol station and it costs him more to fuel up his car and more to heat up his home, then he thinks he's experiencing inflation. And if he does that, he might ask CNBC for a higher wage. If he does that, he might accelerate a purchase of a big ticket item to beat higher prices in the future. And he might behave as though there's inflation. And that's what I think is the big concern right now, the unanchoring of inflation expectations. And I think, Jeff, you hit an important point there. An important element in inflation are wages. And people getting higher wages during a time of still very high unemployment and still a lot of slack in the economy, that would be a sign that an inflation process has begun. But we see no indication of that whatsoever. What we see is the perception of inflation being fueled by energy prices. Brent, crude Brent, has gone from 30 percent lower than a year ago, as recently as November, to 9 percent higher than a year ago right now. That's what Steve's feeling at the pump. And that's going to be 102 percent higher than a year ago by the time that we get to March, and 140 percent higher than a year ago by the time we get to April. So people like Steve are going to continue to complain about the prices of things at the pump. They're going to say, we're experiencing inflation. We're going to see maybe as much as two and three quarter percentage points added to headline increases in CPI, headline inflation rates in the eyes of, of people. But all increases in the CPI are not inflation, and this is not inflation. And this basis effect and increase will work out of the numbers by the time we get to the end of the year. We're getting back to normal from a depressed base. We're not in a realm anywhere close to where inflation, true inflation, is in sight. What do you say? <laughs> what, what what do you say to, to Carl? According to Carl, perceptions are more important than reality. Okay. If you see higher prices, you might think it's inflation. If you see higher prices, you might behave as if there is inflation. <laughs> higher wages in a time of high unemployment and slack in the economy is a sign where inflation inflation has begun. Uh, Carl, give us a couple minutes here, okay? 
The perception of inflation has been fueled by higher oil prices. Fuel may be 140% or more, but no, that, that's it's not inflation, right? Fed doesn't count food and energy in the CPI. So because of that, that's your argument that there's no inflation. Rather, we are coming out of a depressed base and getting back to getting back to normal. Okay, so this is coming the world economy. Hang on. So so this is their their feeling on that. So I mean, let me just kind of say something here. There's a fifteen dollar an hour bill or uh they're trying to to wage minimum raise minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour. There's your higher wages. The economy, there's still slack in the economy. So there's your slack in the economy. And, and Carl says that these things are signs of inflation. Well, I mean it's it's there. It, it's it's all around. I mean I I don't think you will go to anyone at at the grocery store and tell them, you know, when they're paying for a, a gallon of milk or whatever it is, and they see a higher price. I I don't think you're going to tell them, hey. That's just the perception of inflation. It's not really inflation because they don't measure food and energy in the CPI. I mean, Carl, it's a lot of us see this already. I mean, we understand the the economic definition, I guess, however you want to, however you want to call it. But we're seeing it. And we're seeing the money printing. We're seeing the inflation. We're seeing all of these things. And this again is there are reasons why guys are really flocking into things like gold and silver right now stores of wealth stores of value guys understand it and they as i always say whenever you hear an economist use the word recovery i say run so guys understand this and they know what's going on and these are reasons why they are moving into things like like precious metals so uh, carl we i think we'd we'd have to disagree with you disagree with you a bit there um so let me move on to something else that Jay Powell said. The U.S. economy and the world economy, I, I do think, and um, many forecasters agree, that once we get this pandemic under control, um, you know, we, we could be getting through this more, much more quickly than we had feared, and, and that would be terrific. But it's not done yet. The job is not done. That's the thing I keep coming back to, is we've, we've got to finish the job with the pandemic, get it under control so that the U.S. economy can really reopen. Other countries around the world have the same uh, the same set of issues, um, but there, there is we can if we can people will get vaccinated and we can get the disease under control properly. Uh, it, the the second half of this year and thereafter the economy could be could be very good and could be good uh, elsewhere in the world as well. And the fact that uh, there's the savings rate has gone up tremendously in America does that bode well for, down the future in the future as far as Perhaps economic. So a lot of that, a lot of that just is that people have been have not been able to spend. They haven't been able to travel, go to restaurants, and that. So it's, it's kind of forced savings in a way. Um, uh, so they'll spend some of that going forward. You're really thinking, I think, uh, about the fact that you know the U.S. needs more savings so that it'll have more investment and more productivity. You know, it would be nice if we had a higher savings rate, and it would be also nice if we didn't have a. A lot of federal, a lot of dis savings at the federal level. That's a lot of it. Is is that these budget deficits uh, require a lot of assets? Not that we need. That's something we need to turn to again. But I think this is not the time to be thinking about that. But that time, that time will certainly come. All right. Thank you, Jay. Mr. Powell. Mr. Powell says we can turn the economy around once we get the pandemic controlled. Once we get the pandemic controlled, we kind of talked about this before. You want a healthy economy, you have to have healthy people. And what we also learned was you also have to have a healthy mindset. And out of the three, I think that probably became the more important one as we went over this uh, through time. So one thing, though, let's recall the economy was already cracking well before the pandemic. I mean, we knew what was going on in the repo market. That was before the pandemic came. Uh, we saw how interest rates had to come down. So there were already things in the mix that were started to pull that economy down uh savings rate has gone up because people have not been able to spend and it would be nice if we did not have budget deficits they require a lot of assets but this is not the time to be thinking of that so let's not think about how much the fed is going to have to get involved in things like asset purchases let's not think about it well let me show you what's been going on in in the repo market now, for the most part, 
this repo market has been quiet. So let me scroll down a bit. You know, a lot of goose eggs, a lot of zeros, a lot of zeros, a lot of zeros. The Fed hasn't really been doing much in it. So February 19th, February 22. I went through the weekend, February 22. And then all of a sudden, Tuesday, February 23rd, 1 billion, 1 billion in treasury purchases, asset purchases. Fed did a reverse repo. 1 billion was what they were in for. And then a day went by and then half a billion. So they lessened it. Things are looking good. And then another day went by. Okay, now we'll take it all the way down. 0 0.001 billion. And so they took it down and you would think they got it right. Everything is okay. So February 24. And then we come to February 26. 9 billion. The Fed is back in it again in the repo market. Nine billion. They are scooping up assets once again. And this is quietly happening again. I'm not sure how many guys were paying attention to this, but this number is huge. This is significant. It almost tells you yield yield curve control is going on because they are buying at will. And we're going to hear we're going to hear that word coming up more and more. And I want to take a look also at the Fed balance sheet. You see here, it's still going up, still going up. Fed balance sheet, we're at about $7.5 trillion right now. So um, it, it's, this is going to crank up. It's going to crank up again. And in part, I, I feel because we are seeing yields rise, which means the Fed is going to try and control that curve, and they're going to go pedal to the metal, maybe, perhaps, and start scooping up yields or scooping up bonds, I should say, to try and control that, that yield. And another thing Paul said, and we'll, we'll take a quick look at it. We are looking carefully, very carefully, at uh, the question of whether we should issue a digital dollar. And um, it's a, something that central banks around the world are looking at and, and doing so appropriately because the technology now enables us to do that. And it also enables private sector actors to create their own kind of digital quasi money uh, uh, type of instruments. So there are significant both technical and policy questions to do with how we would go about doing that. I would say that uh, we're committed to um, solving the, te the technology problems and to consulting very broadly with the public and very transparently. Uh, with all interested constituencies uh, as to whether we should do this. I would also say we are the world's reserve currency uh, and we have a responsibility to get this right. We don't need to be the first. We, we need to get it right. And so um, we're, but, but this is, this is something we're investing time and uh, labor in right across the federal reserve system. Uh, you may know that the federal reserve bank of Boston has a partnership with uh, MIT looking at one particular thing. We're doing research here at the board. It, it, it does hold out uh, the prospect of, of the things that you mentioned, very positive. It could, it could help with financial inclusion as well. At the same time, you want to avoid creating um, things that might be destabilizing or that might draw funds away from the banking system. We, we have a banking system which intermediates between savers and borrowers. You know, we want to be careful about what the implications are, what we do. So um, a, a very high, high priority project for us. Okay, high priority project for us and an article from Forbes. Let's uh, get through this part here. Okay, Fed Chair Paul says digital dollar is a high priority project as institutional interest in cryptocurrency currencies grow following Bitcoin's blistering rally at the beginning of the year. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said the central bank is closely or looking closely at the prospect of issuing a digital dollar. So here's some key points that we'll just touch on. Digital central bank currencies are forms of money issued by a country's central bank that exist entirely electronically without any connection to physical bank notes or coins. So here again, we go back into a cashless economy, a cashless system here we go they're different from decentralized cryptocurrencies like bitcoin which are not controlled by one central player though some of the underlying technology 
it is the same. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, the other half of the Wonder Twins, Jay and Janet, expressed that same view on Monday. Too many Americans don't have access to easy payment systems and banking accounts, and I think there is something that a digital dollar and central bank digital currency could help with, she said. A couple more key points. Yellen also suggested that a digital central currency could help make payments faster, safer, and cheaper. I mean, how long are we waiting for a transaction anyway if you use your credit card? Uh, I mean, anyway, and that's because proponents of the technology say it will help simplify complicated, often days-long settlement processes. And Powell said Tuesday that since the U.S. dollar serves as the world's reserve currency, it's more important to get the project right than it is for the United States Central Bank to be the first to unveil a digital version of its currency. And I want to take you back to something that, that uh, we need to touch on again, because this is where we are going. We are going to that digital dollar. And as Paul said, it has no connection to physical currency or coin. And this was a banking, the Banking for All Act, which came out a couple of years ago. It was a, a bill before Congress where what they are intending to do is, is the bill or requires the Federal Reserve member banks to provide digital pass-through accounts or digital dollar wallets to residents and citizens and to businesses domiciled in the United States. Among other things, these accounts must provide specified banking services to eligible persons who elect to deposit funds into these accounts. Oh, that's a lot of yada, yada, yada there, but basically what it's saying is they are going to at some point create digital wallets for, for everyone in the States. So again, you can see where this is going. Um, inflation looks to be coming along the way. And throughout history, we know that when inflation hits, they'll issue a new currency. Well, here we have the digital dollar. So if inflation comes, then they have the digital dollar if need be. And they're going to create digital wallets for everyone. So uh, again, these things definitely bring a lot of uncertainty, maybe a lot of uh, uneasiness. And again, these are reasons why you absolutely want to be looking at at stores of value, stores of wealth like silver and, and gold. Um, you know, in no way, in no way are we trying to push sales here. Instead, what we're trying to do is, is do our best to to express or, or, or enlighten or, or bring forth things that are may not be necessarily out in the light yet. Uh, it may not be necessarily mainstream news yet, but things that are happening in, in the background so that you can make the best decisions for for you and, of course, your your family. You know, we we got to take care of some of these these things. So the other half of the wonder to Janet Yellen, she later on came out and had this to say. I don't think that Bitcoin, I've said this before, is widely used as a transaction mechanism. To the extent it's used, I fear it's um, often for illicit finance. Um, it's an extremely inefficient way of um, conducting transactions and the amount of energy that's consumed in processing those transactions is staggering. But it is a highly speculative asset. And, um, you know, I think people should should beware. Um, it it's, can be extremely volatile. And, um, you know, I do worry. I do worry about potential losses that investors in it could suffer. OK, OK. Um, interesting, interesting thing. It, it's interesting how these two, uh, I'm going to call them, you know, Fed people uh, have th their views on things right now. And, and again, we're, we're going to touch on that. So, you know, we have on one half Jay. Jay Powell is one half of the Wonder Twins. And then we have Janet, the other half of the Wonder Twins. And if you really step back and take a look at it, these two guys are playing good cop, bad cop. I mean, you know, uh, Jay is, is saying, you know, we're, we're going to have this here. Um, and Janet is saying, use what Jay is going to bring out. Don't use the other types of cryptocurrencies. They're they're bad for you. You know, so you got kind of this dynamic dynamic going on. But hey, you and I were 
we're smarter than this. You know, we watched that cartoon when we were kids, right? The Wonder Twins. And if you didn't, you know, I'm going to bring that up again. Well, I guess it's up to us. Right. Wonder Twin Powers. Wonder Twin Powers. Wonder Twin Powers. Activate. 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 Shape of an ice ladder. Form of a mouse. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll I'll spare you there. But you you get the picture. Jay and Janet, they are the Wonder Twins. They feel as if they can save the world right now, or or they have the answers for in actuality the problems they created. Digital Dollar Redux: How Janet Yellen and Jay Powell could sink on a CBDC or central bank digital currency. Last year, amid the the bug, a new term entered into the space called the digital dollar during the CARES Act negotiations in Congress. A lot of you didn't know this. The idea immediately drew attention as it represented both the notion of a U.S. central bank digital currency as well as a faster, more efficient, and safer way to distribute an economic stimulus while practicing good social distancing. So again, uh, the pandemic is, I, I hate to say this, but almost like gold for these these guys who who want to use it for for their their own favor, their own objective, their own agenda. And the term digital dollar was coined by Christopher Giancarlo, senior counsel at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher, and former chairman of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And we're going to touch on this CFTC also. Giancarlo announced the digital dollar project as reported by the Wall Street Journal in January of 2020. Prior to this. Giancarlo had been a strong supporter of the cryptocurrency space and blockchain entrepreneurs during his tenure at the CBDC, earning the nickname Crypto Dad. Crypto Dad on Twitter. Okay, so, I mean, make no mistake, as we often talk about here, we are going to go to a digital dollar. We are going to go to CBDC, central bank digital currencies. But about inflation, though, now I know. I don't think it's just me who is already thinking that, yes, we currently have a debt crisis, no doubt in that. We currently have a debt crisis, which could, which could, yes, lead to a currency crisis. And although to compound that currency crisis to get us perhaps into that digital dollar, we, we, have, in, we have inflation. So we see inflation in food, energy, but the Fed doesn't count it, right? We, we know this already. They don't count it in their CPI. It's not inflation. Don't mind the price getting higher. That's just a perception. We see it. We see the inflation, and we count our dollars flying out of our wallets into the whirlpool of inflation, sucking it all up. And central banks, they have a history of doing funny things with, with our real money, our real money. And it's not just our money they play around with. They also play around with our gold and silver, which is, as I was referring to, our real money. And I want to go back in time, back in time just a little, for us to recall what so often plays out in the silver and, and, and the markets, especially with, with all this talk about the SLV and paper contracts paper contracts going on. So let's let's just go back in time a little bit. And what I want you to do is is to notice this date here. 2012. Okay, so let's let's notice this date 2012. And let me make this a little bit larger for you and for me. Okay, so I'll just scroll down a bit. As regulators of the free people, this actually I should back up a bit. It it was a, a letter to the CFTC from a whistleblower, uh, a whistleblower from JP. He was an employee at JP Morgan Chase. So this guy came out and he basically spilled the beans. He took the role of a whistleblower because he no longer has faith and belief that what we are doing for society is bringing value to people. Okay, so he went ahead, sent a letter, became a whistleblower. And what he says is, speaking to the regulators, as regulators of the free people of this country, I ask you to uphold the most important job in the world right now. That job is judge and overseer of all that is justice in the most sensitive commodity markets. There are many middle-income people that invest in the physical assets of silver and gold, 
silver and gold, as well as mining stocks that are being financially impacted in the negative way because of our unscrupulous shorts, as it were again, shorts in the precious metals commodity sector. If you read the CLT with intent, you should, you will find that commercials, even though we have no business being in the commercial sector, which should be reserved for companies that truly produce the metal, are net short by a long shot in not only silver, but gold. Pretty interesting stuff, right? So we go back in time and we see that thing. And again, I wanted you to date 2012. Why the significance? Why the significance? Well, the chairman of the CFTC, according to uh, Gerald Salente's Trends Journal, which is where I got this from, the chairman of the CFTC at that time was Gary Gensler. Now, despite the evidence, pretty overwhelming, actually, evidence from an insider, being the whistleblower, uh, from Goddess Bill Murphy and Andrew McGuire, who actually told them what exactly was going to happen and when, and it did, but no prosecution, nothing really happened, no jail time for top J.P. Morgan execs. Uh, this is Gary Gensler. He, he was the chairman of the CFTC at that time, according to what I read from Gerald Salente's Trends Journal. And the thing is, Gary Gensler's back. And according to Trends Journal again, Gary Gensler is back this time and he will be appointed head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. So uh, really what gives? You know, he's he's back again. So let me show you what happened on, on basically on Gary's watch. Okay, so JP Morgan covering short positions uh, says NIA. NIA, I think, is the uh, National Inflation Association. There you go. Let me make this a bit larger once again. Um, I'll just read a few few parts of this. Mm. Okay. Uh, on March 25th, 2010, uh, this was Gensler's watch, I believe. He started in 2009. Uh, the CFTC held a hearing on position limits in precious metals. Bill Murphy of Gata. Uh, was allowed to speak and right at the beginning of Murphy's speech there was a technical failure on the live television broadcast which was mysteriously fixed as soon as he was done speaking but it didn't stop Murphy who was brave enough to present the evidence of Andrew McGuire a former Goldman Sachs precious metals trader who on February 3rd became a whistleblower when he wrote to Elliot Ramirez, a senior investigator for the CFTC's Enforcement Division, giving him the heads up for a multiple manipulative event signaled on February 5. McGuire described to the CFTC in February 3rd emails exactly what would happen on February 5th, which did occur, like predicted, yet the CFTC refused to take any action against J.P. Morgan or the other conspirators. Conspirators, interesting, interesting word there. So things are just kind of, uh, I'll use the familiar word, circle back. Things are circling back again. Here we, here we go. Here we go again. And so I want to go back just a little bit further. Hang, hang with me. This one is, I'll, I'll go through these slides with you. So let's just go back even a bit further here. And this came out in 1974. You can see the date. Uh, 74, why that date? Well, 68 had to do, we dealt with the London Gold Pool, I think, which closed down in 68. 71, Nixon closed the gold window. And then in 74, we started to see something different called futures. So, uh, you know, it's to me, it's sort of like London Gold Pool 2.0, which I was going to present last week. But nonetheless, uh, you go down a bit, 1974. Um, go down a bit more office action uh, treasury or department of the treasury from the UK London to the department of state secretary of state so let's just move on here so this is a, a telecommunique where begin summary the announced auction of official gold by the US treasury was praised by London gold dealers as being timely and highly contributory to a more stable market 
Some fear, however, that should a single bid for the entire 2 million ounces be forthcoming, prices might increase rapidly, possibly as high as 250 an ounce. So what this is referring to is, is supply. They're worried about supply. They're worried about demand. Physical supply, physical demand. And they anticipate major impact of U.S. ownership will be the formation formation of a sizable gold futures market. Okay? The formation of a sizable gold futures market. But rather small demand for physical holding of gold other than coins. After brief initial surge following deregulation, end of summary. Deregulation meaning when uh, President Gerald Ford at that time, he allowed U.S. citizens to once again own gold. Prior to that, it was more or less uh, illegal to be owning gold if you were a U.S. citizen. So moving forward, the communique. In London to private ownership of gold by Americans. Uh, let me just, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, A-S-S-T, anyway, nonetheless, announced auction of gold by U.S. Treasury while the underlying reasons differed, or differed, the consensus of the dealers was that the move by the U.S. was laudable. In most cases, they stated that the action was unexpected, the timing of the decision was praised as being foresighted, and I think this is when the, the U.S. went ahead and, and put some gold into the market. So the announcement of the sale prior to January 1, 75 date was viewed as timely since there is mounting evidence that much of the recent increase in the price of traded gold has resulted from anticipation of a large American demand following the deregulation date. Again, this is when Ford was going to allow people to once again buy gold in the U.S. Now, even though the dealers themselves expect the physical demand to be rather short-lived, they weren't counting on you buying physical gold. This much said, a recurring comment both in conversations with the gold dealers as well as in numerous telephone calls received by the embassy is that if one buyer or more, likely one buyer from a particular country, which was Kuwait, which was often cited, remember this is 74, where we had inflation and we had all that, you know, the OPEC crisis and things like that. So if one country decides to place a bid for the entire 2 million ounces of U.S. gold being auctioned either at market prices or possibly at higher than market prices, then the effect of the U.S. auction, which, was, which is initially viewed as having a stabilizing force on market prices, would be the opposite. So dealers stated that such or should such a single bid be accepted by the U.S., then the markets would interpret this as a signal that heretofore unrecognized demand was present. Unrecognized demand was present and prices would increase rapidly, possibly as high as 250 per ounce or even higher. So in the dealer's view, the only counteraction to the above hypothetical situation would be for an immediate announcement of an additional sale of like or larger quantity. And to me, in today's Burbage, it sounds like dump more paper into the market. Back then, they would say uh, additional sale of like or a larger quantity because this was dealing with, with physical. And the dealers of whom we spoke stated that to date, there had been no significant activity in the gold markets by official monetary authorities of Arab countries. And they also expressed the view that should market conditions indicate that prices may rise rapidly in the near term. A large volume purchase from oil producing areas should not be totally discounted or unexpected. And while most dealers did not foresee a large Arab demand for the gold to be held as official reserves, they did see, they did see demand from the oil producing areas with Middle East residents being potential active traders in the gold markets, especially in the absence of official sales to stabilize the price. Okay, hang, hang in there, hang in there, guys. So in reply to question, they were not clear whether this type of activity might come from official authorities or only from private sources, but reiterated the idea that the oil-producing areas were the only ones, get this now, were the only ones with sufficient funds to make large physical gold purchases in current market conditions. So again, they are worried about Physical purchases, which means 
demand, which means actually taking a physical. So to the dealer's expectations will be the formation of a sizable gold futures market. And each of the dealers expressed the belief that the futures market would be of a significant proportion and physical trading would be minuscule by comparison. So again, they're setting this up, futures market. Uh, basically, don't worry. We don't really foresee guys taking physical. So also expressed was the expectation that large volume futures dealing would create a high volatile market. In turn, the volatile price movements would diminish the initial demand for physical holding and most likely negate long-term hoarding by U.S. citizens. As to future demand by U.S. citizens for gold, most dealers, most dealers did not foresee demand for physical holdings as significant with the exception of an initial surge to, or the initial surge during the first two to three months of the year following deregulation. And they didn't feel, they did not feel that U.S. citizens on the whole were psychologically prepared to switch from small-scale gold coin purchases to large-scale long-term bullion hoarding. Last slide here. Several expressed the view that the demand for coins after the initial surge would most likely be such that it could be met from within should the U.S. decide to mint gold coins for such purposes. Basically, I guess, like fractional reserve lending, which banks do, uh, you and I were never really meant to, to make a run on gold. So we just weren't meant to make a run on gold. And, and if it were to happen, more physical was supposed to come back on the market. And this is something that the London Gold Pool was supposed to do, but then enter the futures market and then now enter paper contracts. So now if they want to dump more gold, the physical, well, they'll, or silver, they'll just do the paper first and, you know, but really who, who audits and who accounts for all of these things. So, you know, that's, that's a different story. So to wrap this up, you know, make no mistake, this three ring circus is, it's going to continue. And, and in one ring is the government creating mountains of debt and enslaving future generations. In the second ring, ring number two, central banks helping to create the problem, create the problem and then offer a solution. Use our digital dollars. Don't use that Bitcoin. Uh, it's it's just for bad people. So we have Yellen and, and Jay, the Wonder Twins, playing good cop, bad cop. And then a ring three, the real ring, where we are, where the real things are, real money is. And it's slowly, slowly, you know, being, it's trying to be taken away from us. And with the Wonder Twins, Janet and Jerome, working in lockstep now, and don't think otherwise, and with Gary Gensler now having influence with the SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission, you really have to wonder what will surely be the governing body over cryptocurrencies. You got to wonder, meaning, of course, the SEC is going to be ruling over cryptocurrencies. How are they going to be enforcing matters concerning things like Bitcoin as digital dollars work its way into, into our new currency or into our monetary system? So again, uh, there's a history behind these people, and here they are again. So we're going to have to watch the Wonder Twins. And in this, we're going to have to watch them in the shape of a hawk. We're going to have to really keep an eye on them. And we know what is coming. And, hey, we know what's coming. And there's the other side of the coin there as well, where despite all these things that, yes, can be taken negatively, there are going to be positive things that will happen. There are going to be opportunities that are going to come. And we have to position ourselves to, to be able to take these opportunities because the way things are looking, these opportunities are going to be numerous. And so I hope, you know, we can position ourselves to, to be in there to, to um, just to be in there to position ourselves to, to be in a better place. So let me take a look at a few of the comments here. That was a pretty long read. Apologize. <laughs> Apologize for that. But just wanted you guys to get the full context of it. Mark Hill, all governments running on debt are in the long term. Yeah, you know, we, we, we talk about that. It's sort of like central banks are just going to accommodate governments and, you know, they're just going to keep cranking up the printing press until it, you know, like I said, the bearings start smoking and the wheels fall off. And then uh, for them, why would they really be concerned knowing that, okay, we'll just move over into our central bank 
digital currency. So, I mean, you know, it's it should be a concern for us, and especially if, like how Powell said now, um, it's not really going to involve cash and coin or physical and anymore. So that uh, again, that should be that should be a concern for probably all of us. Uh, let me take a look at a few more comments here. Um, let's see. Let's take a look at a few more, and uh, yeah, it's getting close to that time. Um, okay. Well, okay, maybe maybe I'll I'll end it I'll end it there. Um, you know, as always, you know, be a blessing, be a blessing, not a burden. We we know what's going on. We got to do our best to to help people understand. And uh, little by little, uh, let, let's let's not throw the let's not throw the whole book at them and, and expect them to understand or expect people to understand everything as much as you do, uh, all in one go. So we got to work with guys. We, we got to help them understand. Um, for the little guys, if you can stack, you know, I mean, take care of the essentials and absolutely do stack some, stack some gold, stack some silver, not financial advice. It's just things that I would do sharing my opinion. And for guys who are a bit more wealthy, um, you know, do consider a form of wealth protection, uh, because the way things are right now, you know, governments are moving to sort of, um, spread things out among people. And, um, you know, you, you've you also worked hard as well, and you should protect or consider ways to protect what you've made, uh, systemic wealth protection, things like this. They're, they're coming. So we have to do what, what we can what we can do. So, you know, with that, um, I guess what, we'll do, in, what we'll do is we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Uh, kept you guys a bit late. There was a lot, of, a lot of stuff to read, but I appreciate you being here. Appreciate for hell being here to share some of what's going on in, in Singapore. And, um, you know, as always, as I always say, saddle up for what's coming ahead and silver up. And I'll, I'll see you guys next time. Take care, everyone.